Okay, this time I'm holding the recorder in my hand so you might hear some movement. I have to lay down with this stupid sprained arm with ice packs and all blah blah blah. Um, and that's a good lead into this next uh, audio. Which of course I have to do as an audio because you can't really make a good video laying down. Okay. <clears throat> Why did my arm get sprained? Well, it was my fault, really. I wasn't looking where I was going, and I fell down wrong. But that's not the way the trial looks at it. So this is a real good lead-in to this audio. The trial in the whole spiritual life is not about whose fault it is. It's not about the problem, really. It's about what God does to fix it. That's Isaiah 54, 1, Ephesians 1, 15 through 23. Beginning of Job 1, beginning of Job 2, Matthew 4. Those are, you know, primary trial-related passages, although there are other ones. Okay, so now let's get real specific about, well, why is Brainout's arm sprained during tax season when she needs to use it to get out tax returns? Because I live alone. You know, there's a major impediment. Well, God makes other things work that didn't work before when my arm was working. So I can still do my job, but it's a lot more hassle. You know, and for me, getting sick or hurt isn't so much the pain, although I get to be a crybaby about that for a few minutes. But I get bored really easily about being a crybaby. So that's not such a big test. The test is the hassle. The fact that I'm not getting work done that I need to get done. Because to me, everything's about performance. Because I think, just like Satan thinks. You get the point? And I'm just like your typical human being. We all think about, well, you know, i got to get this done. Or this is a good thing to do. How come God lets this happen to me and now I can't pay my bills or get my work done? Yaddy, yaddy. Okay. So I'm just a typical human being in that sense. Okay, but that is exactly what Satan's arguments are. The stupid sprained arm is giving me better insight into something I've long known about what Satan's arguments are in the trial. Why we're here. Why is good evil? You know, that's what kicked this whole thing off. So let's go through that a little bit. Now, I spent a lot of time going through the true core trial issues in Lord v. Satan 1.htm. Link will be in the video description again, just like it is in the Why Evil 123 video. But here we're going to get a little more specific to the topics that have been in the audio. Satan basically starts off with, Okay, God, yeah, I know you're omnipotent, you're perfect, God, yaddy. I also understand that for the sake of freedom, truth be free, that you committed yourself to creating lesser, because everything but you is less, creatures, starting with the angels and then humankind. Okay, and because we got to be free to sin, because truth has to be free, when we do sin, we got to have those free consequences. Okay, fine. But did you consider, and of course Satan's being sarcastic here, claiming God didn't care. Did you consider the fact that when you committed yourself to the burden of us, you also committed us to the burden of you? Now, of course, God did consider that. But that's Satan's big argument, is that he, when God committed to create he basically consigned us, the created, to a weakness state that we were, you know, inevitably, even though freely, even though it's our fault, we would inevitably go there and screw up. And God foreknew all that. So basically, we are consigned to a state of weakness and failure that all could have been avoided if God did it differently. 
that's Satan's core argument. Okay, fine, God, you're all wonderful and everything because you committed yourself to have the burden of the weak, the weak and the small. You know, he's anticipating Romans fifteen three when he says that. Romans fifteen three is the strong must bear the weaknesses of the weak. Okay, but the weak are alive and they're bearing their own weakness that they can't do anything about. It's a true suffering for them. How fair is it to the weak to be weak? You know, when you bring kids into the world, you're taking on the responsibility of caring for those kids. At the same time, the kids, you're making the decision that those kids will come into existence and they have to bear the burden of being weaker than you and under your authority and under your thumb. And they had no say into whether or not they ought to exist in the first place. See how powerful an argument that is? I mean, Satan was created by God. He's smart. He knows what he's saying. He's making a good argument. You can't pretend he's not. I didn't make myself. God made me. That's his argument. Okay, so then why isn't God responsible for what I do wrong rather than me being responsible since I can only be what God made? Sure, I'm free. Sure, I did it of my own volition. But God could have made me differently and I wouldn't have made those mistakes. See the point? And, you know, that same argument is echoed all over the world every day. Anybody who's got more money than you, anybody who's got a better position than you, anybody who's better than you, is always, you know, people are always pointing the finger at people higher than them in authority, higher than them in wealth or health or some kind of something, trying to point the blame at the person who's higher for something that the person who's lower did of his own volition. I could have sued the parking lot people for my sprained arm. It would have been stupid and it would have been immoral to do that. I tripped in a parking lot because it was my own fault. Because I wasn't looking where I was going. But I could have sued for that and probably would have won in court. But that would have been wrong to do. And why could I have sued? even though it's wrong. Because the people that own the parking lot have more money than I do. And a stupid jury would just look at their money versus my money and say, okay, award, bring out the damages. Wouldn't that be, that's just total evil. And it happens every day. This is the same argument that Satan's making. God gave you life. God gave you free life. God gave you independent life. You are free to screw it up. But it is true that God gave it to you with certain parameters or some things you can't do. There's some things you can't fix. So should God be blamed for the fact that you screwed up? Because he could have made you differently so you couldn't screw up? Yeah, he could have made you differently so you could never sin. And then you'd just be a Stepford wife. Chirping along. Oh, how pretty God is. And you have no ability whatsoever to turn against him. Should God have done that? Satan's basically, in, and in essence, saying that's what God should have done. And that, therefore, the hell, the lake of fire, is God's fault. Because God's penalizing us for giving us a freedom that we misuse, and he foreknows that. So why should he penalize us by sending us to the lake of fire? You see the point? God's being judged on his performance by Satan. Satan's saying God made man defective. God made the angels defective. And to him, defective means the freedom to do wrong. The freedom to screw up. The freedom to make a mistake. The freedom to sin. If Satan were God, 
we'd not have those freedoms. We'd all be Stepford wives or seduced into into performance, you know, light a candle, wear pointy shoes, say the mass in Latin, and I'll give you brownie points so that you feel good about yourself, but you really didn't do anything of value. But you feel good about yourself. So you're doing this other thing. And technically speaking, you can say, well, it's not a sin. It's a stupid thing, though, so it should be a sin. It should be a sin to think that lighting a candle is a good deed. It should be a sin to think that if you wear pointy shoes, that somehow that's holy and spiritual. Because it's not holy and spiritual. It's a, it's a lie. But you see the point? Religion gives you little things to do and makes claims about those things that are patently untrue. Like, oh, you're being holy if you do this. Oh, you're serving God. And I don't mean to pick on the Catholics. You, you can just pick any kind of thing that people say if you do this, it's a good thing. It's not a good thing. It's sold as if it's a good thing. That's Satan's plan. That's what Satan's basically offering instead of God's offer of freedom. And yes, you get the free consequences of your decisions. Yeah, and what are those decisions you can make? One of them is to believe that Christ paid for your sins. So isn't God taking on responsibility? For having made you the way he did? First of all, he's committed to living with you the way you are forever, no matter what. And he doesn't have to do that. There's no justification for your existence. He just flat wanted you, period, over and out. Okay, so now you can call God arbitrary, which Satan's doing. And secondly, oh, he gave you the freedom to screw up. He gave you the freedom to be small. So you don't have to be as good or as big as God is in order to have a relationship with God. He could have made you rich and ten times more, you know, higher in abilities than nature, but he didn't. Which is to say that you don't have to be that high or that good in order to have a good relationship with God. He doesn't require it. So he's not looking for performance from you. Now, then you get to the thing, okay, why should we be penalized for sin then? Well, but what is sin? Sin is something that harms you of itself. If Johnny doesn't learn to take out the trash when he's a kid, then he's going to have trash accumulating in his apartment when he's an adult. And he's going to get sick. So you're going to call taking out the trash a good deed to teach Johnny that it's good not to have trash in the house. You're going to even pay him to do that to help him remember that it's good not to have trash in the house. And then when Johnny learns, you know, more in school and he finds out what a germ is and he finds out what contamination is and he finds out what disease is and how having trash breeds all those things, he's going to want to take out the trash anyway. But he's got a basis for learning that because you taught him when he was five years old to take out the trash. But the essence of taking out the trash doesn't serve the parents. The parents could take out the trash better. Johnny probably dribbles the trash when he drags the trash can to the curb. So the parents can do a better job of taking out the trash than Johnny. So Johnny's not really doing anything for his parents. We're not really doing anything for God. It's a benefit to us. So sin is what's harmful to us. Now, sin is also a rejection of God, God's rules, whatever they are. In the garden, before there was, you know, good and evil, there was only one rule. Don't eat from a certain tree. Here's why. You'll get knowledge. Because i got to give you the ability, the right, to choose against me, and to choose Satan's plan. 
So Satan's plan hung on that tree. It wasn't actually in the fruit. They were choosing Satan's plan when they ate the fruit. That's what it meant. It's just like when you, if you're an American and you lower a flag from a flagpole and you stomp on it, stomp on it on the ground, you're basically evidencing a negative attitude toward the United States of America. The flag itself is just a piece of cloth. It doesn't mean anything. But you're using it in a way to express a negative attitude. Same idea as eating from the tree. Same idea as sin. Now, a lot of times when we sin, we're not consciously meaning to reject God at the same time. But it is harmful if we sin. We have to be punished just like you have to punish Johnny for doing certain things. You have to punish him or he doesn't learn that it's not good for him. Same thing for sin. And, and here's the deeper issue that Satan's conveniently ignoring all the time. If you're rejecting God as a person, you're saying, hi God, yeah, okay, fine, you made me, but I don't want anything to do with you. Okay, what's God supposed to do with that? If he created truth, truth has to be free, it has to have its free consequences, and you're using your freedom to say, hi God, I don't want a relationship with you. What's he going to do? Well, he has a lot of options. He can zap you and you never existed in the first place. But he already created you. He committed to that. So what's he going to do? Go back on his commitment? And when he committed to you, he committed to you under all circumstances. When he made you, you drew your first breath outside the womb. Okay, so you're here now. When God made your soul, it's it's eternal. I mean, eternal in the sense of everlasting, not eternal in the quality sense of eternal life. Eternal life is a quality of life. Everlasting is the period of life. So your soul is eternal in period now. Once you believe in Christ, it's eternal in quality too. God's quality. God is eternal life. Okay, but you don't want that eternal life. You don't want that quality of life. Okay, so if you don't want the quality of life that's God, you instead want a quality of life that's as far apart from God as possible, well, what kind of life is that going to have to be? Hell, what we call hell, which eventually becomes the lake of fire, Matthew twenty-five forty-one. Satan doesn't want to have a relationship with God. Satan wishes he were never born. That's the third temptation in Matthew 4. Christ was being tempted to kill Satan. Satan picked the most egregious thing he could say, hoping to get Christ angry so that Christ would just zap him into oblivion. Christ didn't give in to that. He said, go away. Satan wanted to go away, all right, but he wanted Christ to zap him away. All right? Satan wants, wants to be as far away from God as possible, and if he can't do that, then he wishes he were never even created. He's got a love-hate relationship with God. Okay, so, home alone. Where do you want to go? Where can you go? What kind of place is going to be as far away from God as possible in both quality and quantity? What's the opposite of God? lake of fire you want to be by yourself you want to be away from God you want to be away from all God's provision hi well this is everything I'm not it's called the lake of fire and I'm still seeing you and I'm still in it and I'm experiencing hell with you before you're even there but as far as you're concerned you're apart from me that's best I can do and stay committed to you. And by the way, one of these days, maybe, even though I know you won't, maybe one of these days you're going to get sick of all that burning flame. And you're going to say, okay, I believe in Christ now, get me out of here. And then I will. I'll pull you out. Because Christ died for all time. Hebrews 10, 10 through 14. 
He didn't die for just some people. That's where the Calvinists are stupid again. And he didn't die for just a short period of time. He died for all time. So a billion years from now, if there's somebody that's in that lake of fire who wants out and believes in Christ, he can get out. The Bible never says that God forces you to stay in hell forever. It does say that hell lasts forever. And it does say people go there in a number of places. And only the perennially, um, what do you want to call it, the terminally insane think that hell doesn't exist. It exists all right. Because God committed to make you at birth and your soul never dies. So it's got to live somewhere after you get out of this body. Where's it going to be? With God or without God? With God, you believe in Christ. Without God, you don't. But you still can. Because your soul never dies. So, how stands the case? Satan says, you know God, we wouldn't sin in the first place if you didn't make us able to. We wouldn't have these weaknesses that you built into us. If you didn't make them, where are you taking responsibility for what you did? Okay, fine. You're a masochist. You're a sadist. You want to commit yourself to the lowness of creatures. I get that. But why should we have to bear the penalty for your decision? That's a good argument Satan makes. And what is God's reply? Isaiah 45, 7 through 19. I created the evil one, meaning Satan. Satan's the guy who started the whole sin ball rolling. Could have been somebody else, but it happened to be him. Somebody would have been first. And by the way, I didn't create the universe. Messed up. That's Isaiah 45, 18 through 19. I created it fine, and it became... Tohu Wabohu, that's Genesis 1 2. So Isaiah 45 18 and 19, when Christ is talking, he's referring back to Genesis 1 1 when he created it, and Genesis 1 2 when it became Tohu Wabohu due to the angelic conflict. And what is the rest of Isaiah 45 about? Him appointing a savior, Cyrus there being the named prototype because in Isaiah 45 Isaiah is predicting the downfall of the temple to fall down to Babylon and then Babylon is going to go down and Cyrus is going to rescue and thus cause the rebuilding of the temple and all this is happening 126 years before the temple goes down and the temple is going to go down 126 years before it's allotted time is up and I cover that in my Psalm 90 videos and my Isaiah 53 videos. Okay, so prophetically and pregnantly, God is depicting the saving of a destruction that he himself is going to take on. This whole trial is about what God does to you as the better good versus Satan's contention that man ought to be given stuff, limited small things that he from his own ability can do in order to feel good before God. Because after all, God made man small. We have to pee. We have to eat. We have to sleep. It's humiliating to be in this body, even if there were no sin. So Christ took on that body and he who had no sin was made sin as a substitute for us so that we become the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 So isn't God taking on responsibility for having made us so small and weak and able to sin? And didn't God pay for the very sins that he took the responsibility for indirectly creating because he created beings who can sin? So now where is the fault? 
God took on all the commitments. God took on all the costs. God pays for absolutely everything. And he bears all the burdens. And if you want to claim <clears throat> that the human or the angel is bearing the burden of being weak and small compared to God, okay, fine. But then you get to depend on God for your needs. And then he uses that dependence to teach his own character and have a relationship with you, providing for your needs in very clever ways. Like using a sprained arm to help me understand things about him I didn't understand as well before. During tax season when I really need to be working. Apparently I don't really need to be working. So he's going to make something else work so that my clients don't get hurt. So I get all these extra hours to just sit and learn him because I have to lay down. During a time when I should be working. See how I switch suddenly from the big, high principle, generic point to my own life? You can do the same thing. I just don't know your details. Or I'd have picked your details instead of my own. So he's going to deliver mankind. He's going to deliver the angels if they want it. I'm laying here and I can just say, God, you know, I'm not doing my job. I need to do my job. Please enable whatever needs to be enabled so my job still gets done. Guess what? I'm now depending on him to do it. Because I lost my arm, so his arm's going to take its place. Well, now, isn't the client better served if his arm is doing the work rather than mine? Isn't it a better good If it's his arm doing the job, tell me truly, would you rather have your best friend give you a gift? Or would you rather have God do it? Who's going to give you the better gift? So everything gets turned on its head. That's Second uh, Corinthians 12, 9 through 10. <coughs> 8 through 10. That's why Paul said, I'd much rather be weak. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Because then God has to do the work. So then where's your claim about performance? Where's your claim about weakness, Satan? Yeah, I'm responsible for having fallen in the parking lot with my arm. Why should I blame God for that? God doesn't owe me for that. But hi, look what God's doing with it. That's better than the work I could have done if my arm worked. So why shouldn't God let me have the consequences of my own bad decisions? If this is how he's going to rescue bad decisions or weakness or failure, then please let me have more failure. Just like Paul said, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Now that completely undercuts this is why it's so devastating. That completely undercuts all of our ideas about why we're alive. Most of the time, you're getting through the day, every day, based on some idea that you should do good or get good. And if you can't do good or get good, you're very depressed about it. But if God's going to deliver you, if God's going to use that weakness to do a better good than if you could have done a good yourself, then okay, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. You see the difference between Satan's plan, which is all about good deeds and performance, and God's plan, which is just 2 Corinthians 12, uh, 8, even 7 through um, 10. My power is made operational in weakness. That's how my pastor translated that. My power is brought to perfection, completion. The word means completion. It's teleo in the Greek. My power is brought to completion. It's usually translated perfection, but it means completion. In weakness. We mature in weakness. The cross is Christ being weak. 
not strong. He doesn't use his deity to pay for sins. He just hangs there. Thinking, yes, Father, yes, Father, yes, Father, yes, Father. That's all he's doing. He's letting it be done to him. He's not saving himself. He's not doing any work. He's letting himself be weak while he's being imputed with our sins on the cross. And he's agreeing to it. The hardest thing for him was not to use his own power. The Spirit sustained him. He didn't even sustain himself on the cross. The Spirit sustained him. He didn't resurrect himself either, though he could have. That's in Romans 8, 11. Father resurrected him. He allowed Father to resurrect him instead of resurrecting himself. He did not use his own power. So that totally undercut Satan's arguments about well, allow the little man to have his religion so he can use his own abilities and feel good about himself. So the burden for us is that we feel bad about ourselves all the time. Yeah, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. So here I am laying on my couch with some ice packs, with a useless arm, during tax season, and God's doing a better job a better good for me and my clients and everybody else because they get to talk to this tape recorder and he's going to make it benefit somebody he's already made it benefit me well that's a better good than if I got the tax returns done huh so when we talk about good deeds as Christians we're not at all thinking like God does we're thinking like Satan does we're thinking about what we do we're thinking about the values that we think are important. And we have absolutely no clue of all the surrounding issues. And we have zero clue about what God thinks are, is important. Because Christ just hung on the cross. He didn't do squat. He stayed weak. So God did it to him. And that's how come we get to be strong in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 and with that, I end this audio.